It's not even that important. Right, because you just need to be it to happen properly. Right. I imagine there's quite a lot of tension. Yeah, see over here, these switches are super tension off. Oh. I'm pretty sure. And then it would still be in tune. I think. Kind of like how you can take the snare off a drum. Oops. This thing over. Everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Peace be with you. And also with you. All right. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, we're excited today to be together, but also we're excited to have Derek Blumenthal with us from Chosen People Ministries. And uh, this is a Sunday after Pentecost Sunday, as you already know, but he's going to be speaking on Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Birth of the Church. And as you have been told already, we're going to be doing a love offering for him. And there are two plates that are, that are marked especially for that right here. Uh, if by chance you've already written a check to Richland, we can, we can handle that. We'll convert that and mail it uh, to him. But if you are going to write a check, we just ask you to write it to Chosen People Ministries or CPM. And, of course, you can put cash in there if you'd like to do that. And we are continuing to do the offering as we've been doing it since COVID came our way, which is it's going to be here at the front and uh, at the exits. Um, in August, we're going to be switching back to actually passing the plates and making it a more integral part of our worship because we want to honor God with our offerings. So I feel like it kind of feels like it's tacked on at the end right now. But uh, also, Derek will have some materials at the back table there. And uh, so please be praying for him as he comes to lead us in worship today. So we're going to go into our worship through music. We'll be sharing communion, and then without any further introduction, Derek will be coming up. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We love you, Lord, and we bless your holy name. We do ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead our time. We yield to you. We know that you are a God who speaks. You speak to your people. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak today. Help us to hear what you're communicating today through the worship time, through the music, through the time of interacting with each other and with you, through prayer, through, through our guest speaker today. Lord, we just offer every element of our worship to you today. We hope it all pleases you. And that's, our, that's our desire. So we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. All right, well, we're going to have some fun worship today. Let's all stand up and praise the Lord. Trumpet call, lift your voice. Hear our jubilee, out of Zion's hill salvation. 
Father, you are so holy. I thank you for making a way for us to come into your presence and worship you.
honor you as the living God who was, who is, who is to come. Lord Jesus, we recognize that you are the crucified one, the one raised from the dead never to die again. You won the victory over death and the grave for us. And one day you're coming back and death itself will die. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you for your sacrifice for us, that you came into this world because of your great love for us to redeem us, to reconcile us to God the Father, to make it possible for us to live with him forever in the presence of the tree of life. We thank you, Lord. We honor you today. We thank you as we come to your table, as we remember your words to those first disciples, that you are the Passover lamb. You are the one who spares us from death. It is your blood that covers us and protects us. So, Lord, we honor you today. We thank you for today. We give you all honor and glory in this day and in every day. Thank you, Lord, that you are holy. And we join the angels and the living creatures around the throne proclaiming that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Lord, we honor you today. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask you to move in and through your people as we share fellowship with the living Christ, the living Messiah. As we gather here, recognizing that you, Lord Jesus, you are the head of this table. And you promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in the midst. So we recognize that we come celebrating fellowship with you as we join together. Koinonia, participation in your life and in your death. Thank you, Lord. We honor you and we worship you through sharing at the Lord's table today, your table. Amen. Let me invite the deacons to come on up and we'll uncover the table and we'll celebrate the Lord's table today together. used to doing this with a handheld microphone. I didn't think about putting on my other microphone until too late because I was thinking about our guest speaker being wireless today. But we're told that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord took the bread and he gave thanks for it. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you for this bread representing the body of Christ nailed to that cross for us. Lord, we thank you that you took our pain and our diseases. You carried our griefs and sorrows to that cross. And we thank you so much for that. Father, we thank you for this bread. And we thank you for the bread, the one bread, the one loaf present here today, this representation of it, the body of Christ gathered here, various members, gifted by your spirit, and yet one body. Lord, help us. We continue to cry out for revival in the church, for a great awakening, a spiritual awakening in our land and across the world. Thank you, Lord, for your gift to us. We honor you. Amen. 
So we're told that after he had given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, do this in remembrance of me. also told that in similar fashion, after the supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. Father, we thank you for this cup, representing the blood of Christ, the blood of the new covenant, the eternal covenant, sealed by his blood. We thank you, Lord, for an eternal redemption, one that cannot be taken away. We thank you for the gift of everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for allowing yourself to be manhandled and nailed to that cross, shedding your own blood so that we might live. We honor you today. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. We do serve a living Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is now at the right hand of the Father. He is preparing to return. We don't know the timing of that. It could be 1026, one minute from now. It could be 100 years from now. It could be 1,000 years from now. I don't think it's going to be that long, but I don't know. Only the Father knew the timing, Jesus said. We know he's coming back. God is always faithful to his promises. And so we, we don't just remember a famous man who lived a long time ago today. We're celebrating the living God who is returning to redeem his people, to save his people who've been waiting for him. So we celebrate here at the Lord's table. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite you to come up. We're going to come down the center aisle. There will be two lines that will form. You'll be able to come up, take some of the bread, step over, and then uh, take the cup. We'd ask you to go ahead and take communion while you're up here. And then there's a glass bowl on either side over here, and we just ask you to drop that cup into that bowl. Then you can go back down the side aisle and uh, get back to your seats. All right? So uh, last of all, we're going to be serving Jennifer, who's going to be playing the harp during the communion time. So if I forget about her... Just yell at me. <laughs> All right, because that's a, a, a new feature today, and Jennifer, we're so glad you're here to do that. Thank you so much. All right, so let's come to the Lord's table.
shalom, everyone. Oh, you guys are all Hebrew scholars already. I don't even need to be here. Uh, shalom is a greeting in Hebrew. Does that sound okay? You guys hear me all right? Good. I wanted to thank you all so much for having me here today to worship with you and uh, to share with you what the Lord has placed on my heart. Uh, my name is Derek Blumenthal. I am a missionary with Chosen People Ministries. And uh, just a little bit about Chosen People. Uh, we exist as a ministry to preach the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, to the Jewish people throughout the world. Uh, it is one of the oldest ministries of its kind. We are in our 128th year of ministry, so a couple of years. Uh, and the Lord has been using us to bring the light of Messiah to the Jewish people all of that time. Uh, I'll tell you more about Chosen People Ministries toward the end. Uh, but first, just a little bit about me. So I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. Yes, there are some of us around. Amen is right. <laughs> but you know, it's not adequate to say that I simply believe in him. And I know uh, many, if not all of you, would share the same sentiment. You know, the scriptures say that even... Uh, the demons believe and tremble, and rightfully so, right? Uh, I know, personally, that he is the promised Messiah, and I've been transformed by his spirit, and I hope you have too. Uh, when I was 16 years old, you know, I wasn't raised in a particularly religious home, um, but when I was 16 years old, I heard the gospel really clearly for the first time. And uh, it was through some high school friends of mine that were all involved, uh, unbeknownst to me, they were very sneaky. Uh, they <laughs> were all involved in a, a ministry called Young Life. Have you heard of Young Life before? Young Life is a remarkable ministry to high school teens. And uh, these guys were just loving me for the Lord. And I, I heard the gospel clearly for the first time, in fact, on my 16th birthday. So I was born and reborn on the same day. And I knew when, when I heard the truth, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that it was for me. Uh, any of the Jewish objections that one might have to the gospel simply didn't matter because the truth had broken through all of that and my life was forever changed. Um, you know, the Bible teaches us that on one glorious day, one glorious day, all Israel will be saved. That's a promise. And just like your pastor said, he is a God of promises. He makes good on his promises. One day all Israel will be saved and I count myself blessed to be among the first fruits of the, that miraculous work. Uh, has nothing to do with me, certainly. Has nothing to do with any of us, does it? But today, part of my ministry is to serve as a Messianic rabbi of a Messianic Jewish congregation in Norfolk, Virginia, called Beth Messiah Synagogue. And uh, Beth Messiah has been there for about 42, 43 years now, standing as a, a long-term beacon of light to the Jewish community in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. And uh, I can tell you, just in the five years that I've been there, Really, even just in the past year, the Lord has been doing something very, very special. There are Jewish people, Jewish non-believers, just walking through our doors regularly um, <laughs> and coming to know him. It, it is, there is, a, I don't know, a fresh resurgence of the spirit that is very, very exciting to be a part of. Uh, I don't know if Jewish ministry has ever been on your radar before, but trust me when I tell you it's not very common for Jewish people to just walk into any sort of gospel-centered anything and say, tell me more about this Jesus, uh, but it's happening. And it's amazing. It's amazing. So my hope today is to share with you all uh, my heart and my burden for reaching Jewish people like myself. Uh, and my hope also is that you would partner with me in praying for their salvation. This morning, specifically, I'd like to share with you about one of God's appointed times, one of his moedim in Hebrew, the appointed times, a biblical holiday called Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks, like the plural of week, as in like a calendar week. Uh, you may know it as, as Pentecost. Pentecost is just a Greek word that means 50 days, and we'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. But we're going to discover today how and why God chose to use this appointed time, Shavuot, to be the time in which he would pour out his spirit on the believers in the first century. Uh, it was on his kehilah, is the Hebrew word for his congregation. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It was a deliberate choice, as are all of God's choices, right? Uh, and it's very exciting to see. But I want to take you back to the Jewish prophet, Joel. 
This is what Joel says in uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 28. And actually, Lord, may you bless your word as we look at it today. May you illuminate it for us, that we together as a body of Messiah may better understand your heart of salvation, your plan of salvation for the Jewish people and for the entire world. We thank you, Lord. Hashem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. This is Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 28. It will come about after this that I, God speaking, of course, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. See, you never, you don't get disqualified if you get too old. Isn't that good news? I uh, am maybe not that old yet, but I'm starting to feel my age. I have three young daughters, Lily, Violet, and Daisy are 14, 10, and 6, respectively. And, well... Tell my back that, because I was just playing with them yesterday and hurt myself about four different ways. So pray for me, please. <laughs> but I'm happy to know that uh, I don't know which category I'll fall in, old men or young men at the time, but dream dreams or have visions, either one's good. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, he says. You know, many of us are, are familiar with this passage, especially because later on in the New Testament, this is quoted in Acts chapter 2 the time when we see the Spirit poured out on the Kehillah. Um, again, we're going to look at that in just a bit, but, you know, we can get excited about the plans of God for the, you know, the last days and the exciting things that he's doing and the plans and plans to do in the future. But Joel chapter 2 that we just read tells us even more about what God intends to do. Verse 28 that we read, it says it will come about after this. That's what we started with. Well, after what, right? So let's go back a little earlier in Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Joel 2, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. Isn't it wonderful that our Lord is righteous and compassionate towards us? The Lord will answer and say to his people, not just a people, his people. Behold, I am going to send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them. And I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. If you don't know much about Israel's history, my people have been kicked out of every land we've ever been in since creation. To say that we've been a reproach among the nations is an understatement. Here God is promising to his people at some point there will be a rest from all of that. There will be a security in the land under his own kingship where we won't have to worry about expulsion or persecution ever again. I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. But I, but, it's but, this is what's going to happen instead. But I will remove the northern army far from you. I will drive it into a parched and desolate land and its vanguard into the eastern sea and its rear guard into the western sea. All of your enemies will be dispersed, is what he's saying. And its stench will arise and its foul smell will come up. It's lovely things, right? For it has done great things. Do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad. Did you know that you can choose to rejoice and be glad? That's a command. He's not saying, I'm going to cause you to rejoice. He's saying, rejoice. Make the choice to do so. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. Very poetic in, in prophetic language here. For the pastures of the wilderness have turned green, for the tree has borne its fruit. The fig tree and the vine have yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God. I think there's, this is ripe for lyrics to songs. And by the way, thank you for all of the messianic-themed music today. I felt very at home. I don't know if that's typical for all of you, but that was a blessing to me. There you go. Good. Good. Baruch Hashem. Praise God. So rejoice, O sons of God, and be glad in the Lord, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down you, uh, for you the rain, the early and latter rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust. That's a lot of locusts. What he's saying is he's going to make restitution for all of 
the suffering that we've experienced. And it's not inappropriate, even if you are not you know, uh, of Jewish lineage, it's not inappropriate to apply this to our own lives because this affects the entire world. The world has been under the curse of Adam since the fall. God's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to pay for all of it, all of the suffering. Every tear will be wiped away. It's going to be paid for. It is paid for, but we're going to see it in its full fruition. My great army, which I sent among you, continuing here in Joel chapter 2, verse 26, you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Adonai, the Lord, your God, and there is no other. And my people, he repeats, will never be put to shame. I don't even need to preach. It speaks for itself. But I will. Don't worry. <laughs> so we see this, this precedes the pouring out of God's spirit that we started reading with. This precedes that. So before God pours out his spirit to all nations, not just on Israel, but to all nations, that there will be a restitution of the promised land of Israel, and the people of Israel will know him. And not just know about him, but know him in a deep and intimate way. They will be, in other words, in a right and faithful relationship with him. That is amazing. That is amazing. God has placed on my heart personally and, and the hearts of people like myself, <clears throat> pardon me, to reach Jewish people in particular with the gospel of Jesus. So let me make it very clear. Jewish people, like anybody else in the world, need Messiah for salvation. There's no alternate route. There's no special whatever. Uh, we all like sheep have gone astray, the scriptures say. And on the Messiah, our sin was laid. And that is true for everybody, regardless of our ethnicity, Jew and Gentile alike. Being called God's chosen, because the scriptures refer to Israel as God's chosen people, that has never meant that we don't need a Messiah or that we have some special arrangement with God that doesn't require repentance and faith in Jesus. So please understand that. On an individual level, all of us, regardless of our ethnicity, were born into Adam with a sin nature that separates us from our perfect, holy creator. God has always desired to restore us to his image, the image that we were created in, the image of God. There's nothing and no one else in all of creation that bears his image like humanity. He wants to give that back to us. And thus he sent Jesus, in Hebrew, technically Aramaic, Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. That's the name his mama called him. God sent him to die a sinner's death and to pay our debt. And placing faith in him makes us brand new creatures no longer shackled by sin, but alive in the newness of life. It's the greatest deal going. That's the gospel that we're familiar with. But what we can miss is the fact that God's plan of salvation began centuries before Jesus was born. When God chose for himself a people that were meant to be an example to the whole world of what it looked like to be in right relationship with the creator of the universe. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, you don't have to turn there right now, but you can take a look later. In Deuteronomy 7, God explains that God sovereignly chose Israel to be his ambassadors to the world. Their relationship with him was never meant to be exclusive and kept to themselves, but they were meant to be a beacon of light to the nations to show the world what it looks like to be in right relationship with God. To show the world what it looks like to know the one true God and to be a blessing to all nations. And it was through these very people, the Jewish people, that God provided the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior. And it was meant to be, it was meant to be, through those same people, that God would communicate the message, message of salvation to the rest of the world. 
So he brought Messiah through Israel, and Israel was meant to share that with the world. Now, fast forward to the first century, from Joel's time to the first century. It's the time of the book of Acts and following. We see that the community of the followers of Messiah were in fact exclusively Jewish. Did you realize that? (laughs) The first couple hundred years of the walk of our faith, the followers of the way, they were called, which in Hebrew is haderech, derech, that's me. It was an exclusively Jewish movement for a while. Not meant to stay that way, but it was. And uh, it's clear through the language of the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament that the intention, God's intention for his people was to reach the entire Jewish world with the gospel. And then, in addition, it became more and more clear that these Jewish believers were to share their faith with the Gentiles, the nations. And it was to be spread throughout the entire world. And that the body of Messiah would grow and expand and diversify to become one new man, as the scripture describes. Listen to this from Acts chapter 1. You can turn there. Acts 1, starting in verse 12. Acts 1, starting in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they uh, had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, the whole gang's here. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. These, all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Verse 15, at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together. So the the disciples, now probably at this point we called the apostles, right, the ones who would be Uh, In Hebrew, the shlichim, the sent out ones. That was God's intention for his disciples, the ones who went through intensive training with him, were closest to him, to then take his message and their firsthand experience and share it with the known world. But we have to wonder, why at this time were 120 of them all gathered together to begin with? Why were they all in Jerusalem? What was going on? Well, two reasons, I would say. For starters... They were all in Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, which is one of three what are referred to as pilgrimage festivals in the scriptures. So we're not going to take you there right now, but Leviticus chapter 23, I really encourage you, take some time this week and take a look at Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 is God's calendar. Leviticus 23 describes all of the holy days that the people of Israel were to celebrate on an annual basis the cycle of celebrations when they were to be um, uh, honored and remembered and how. And there's other places in the scripture that describe even more so. But it gives us a rundown of all of them, starting with the weekly Sabbath, then Passover, and then several others, including Shavuot. Now, Shavuot is a really unique and distinct holiday that's mentioned in Leviticus 23. And the reason I say so is because Shavuot is not given a date. Every other holiday in Leviticus 23, God says, on this date, do this, remember this. On this date, do this, remember this. This is the Passover. This is first fruits. This is all of the others, right? Shavuot isn't given a date. From the Passover, God instructs Israel to start counting days. It's called the counting of the Omer. There was a daily um, offering given to the Lord called an Omer, and Omer is is a a unit of measure. It was a, a wheat offering, a grain offering given to the Lord every day, starting from Passover for seven full weeks, 49 days. So they kept seven full weeks, 49 days. Every day we were to count the Omer, and then it says after the 49th day, the 50th day, is Shavuot. That's why it's called the Feast of Weeks, because it comes after the end of seven full weeks, that intermediate time between Passover 
and Shavuot. So Shavuot doesn't stand on its own. It is an extension, in a way, of Passover. If we didn't celebrate Passover and know when Passover was, we couldn't count forward and know when Shavuot was. They're linked together. Does that make sense? So, and God links them together for a special purpose. And it's, it's foreshadowing the entire gospel. You see, Passover was the time that Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, gave his life for us. He was, as mentioned before, the Passover lamb. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. Again, nothing God ever does is. So he was our Passover lamb. He was raised from the dead on what's called Yom HaBikarim, first fruits, another biblical holy day in Leviticus 23. And then as we counted the Omer on through to Shavuot, of course, we have um, his, his resurrection and his ascension on the 40th day, right in the middle of the counting of the Omer. And he promised something would happen following that that happened to happen on Shavuot. So, of course, Yeshua always promised to return. Even then, the believers in his day didn't know exactly when. They thought maybe it was going to be in their day. In fact, some New Testament authors talk about him coming back, fully expecting it in their physical lifetime. And they were right to have that hope. I think God instills that in the hearts of believers in every generation. The immediacy of his return. It could be at any time, truly. So the people were gathered in Jerusalem, this 120 or more, were gathered together, of course, for Shavuot, but maybe even in a more immediate sense, they all knew of Yeshua's, Jesus' ascension fact that he had physically ascended into the kingdom, promising to return. And they were waiting now together for his promise of the comforter. The comforter. Listen to this from John chapter 14. Of course, Yeshua's words prior to his, uh, to his death and resurrection. John 14, starting in verse 16. I will ask the Father, Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Isn't that wonderful news? When Yeshua left, he didn't leave. He gave us the helper, the comforter. After a little while, continuing in verse 19, after a little while, the world will no longer see me but you will see me because I live, you will live also. And in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. What a wonderful unity. Later on, same chapter, John 14, starting at verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, he clarifies, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. And If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. He's saying, don't weep for me because you miss me. This is the plan. I'm here with you. Don't miss this. This is what's meant to happen, what has to happen. You're going to experience intimacy with me in a greater sense because I go away because I will instill my spirit within you. Do you know God's plan of salvation always included greater and greater and greater intimacy with us? Think about it. The people of Israel in the wilderness, he told them to build a tabernacle so that he could come down and dwell with them and they could meet with him. And now here's our Messiah saying that no longer do you have to meet with me in this special place. I am going to come into you and you will be my temple, my tabernacle, even closer Closer and closer and closer. That's what our Father wants with us. That's what your Father wants with you, an ever more intimate relationship. No matter where you are on the spectrum of faith, God is inviting you closer. You ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? I love them. In the final book of the series, I won't get into it. I can get nerdy about it. But um, (laughs) who said it? That's exactly what I was just going to say. There's an invitation into the kingdom. Kingdom Aslan is the Jesus figure in the book, and he's inviting his followers further up and further in. 
further up and further in. Come closer. Come closer. That's exactly what our Messiah is doing. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. Not long ago, I had an opportunity to sit with four new Jewish believers. It was a family, three sisters and one of their husbands. Um, the husband, I guess in his mid to late 70s, he was in a nursing home. And uh, through a pretty miraculous experience, they all came to faith together. It was a really beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, the gentleman uh, who had Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and was, was in pretty bad shape and most of the time was not very coherent. But in the time that he had heard the gospel and was meeting with myself and, and my rabbi, um, he was really miraculously present in these conversations, talking about the Lord. And the last time that I met with the four of them together, he has since gone on to be with the Lord, the, the sisters we keep in touch with. But one of the sisters in particular said that her entire life, she had never had a good night's sleep, tormented by fear and condemnation. She's just never slept well in her entire life. And she's no criminal. She's, by all accounts, a, a pretty typical good person. She told me that when she came to know Yeshua, that very night, she slept better than she ever has in her entire life because that weight of condemnation and that fear was lifted. And I got to speak to her from the scriptures about the helper the Spirit of God that was in her heart, explaining to her why that was so. And she said, that's it, you're exactly right. It's the helper, the comforter. The comforter has come, and she was so relieved, and her family was so relieved to know that they were new creations in Messiah. It didn't matter how long they were in life. It didn't matter what they had been through. They were never further, too far from God's grasp. But back to Acts chapter 1. Yeshua's Talmudim, his students, his followers, they knew that they needed to have a formal organization. This couldn't just be some grassroots thing that has no organization any longer. Otherwise, uh, we know that, by the way, otherwise they wouldn't have felt it important to replace Judas. What would be the point if they weren't going to build something formal? They knew that the disciples would be leaders in this messianic Jewish movement that started to grow very, very quickly. Listen to this from Acts chapter 2. The famous day of Pentecost, Shavuot. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, like we were reading in Acts 1. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jewish people living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. From every nation, they were all there because of the Holy Day. So there were Jewish pilgrims from all over in Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this time is packed to the gills with worshipers. Verse 6, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, "Why are not all of these all speaking? Uh, all, excuse me. Why are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? They could tell by their accent, probably the way they looked, that they were from the Galilee region. How in the world were these Galileans speaking their languages? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born?" Of course, it goes on to say that their first explanation, everyone thought that they were just day drinking and that, and that it was nonsense. But, um, of course, it wasn't that. It was a remarkable miracle. And these witnesses of the Shavuot miracle then got to hear Peter explain ever so eloquently, starting in Acts 2.14, about the life and the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, Jesus, and how it fulfilled what the prophets had foretold for so long. Listen to this further in Acts 2, uh, starting in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Do you remember ever being pierced to the heart when you heard the gospel for the first time? 
Listen, if you've never heard it and you've never been pierced to the heart, today can be your day. Let it pierce your heart. That's what God wants. He wants to call you son. He wants to call you daughter. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? This is amazing news. What do we do with it? Peter said to them, Repent. Turn from everything you believed and you were living for before. Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just like we have, is what he's saying. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were immersed, baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Not too bad. So clearly, God wasn't finished building and adding to his family. It didn't stop here. In Acts chapter 4, he added 5,000 more. No big deal. 5,000 in a day which, by the way, may be multiplied probably by three. If you just count the men in a group, including women and children, the group was probably about 15,000. This didn't just include lay people and the uneducated. It said that many Jewish priests also came to faith. This wasn't just a movement of farmers and, and you know, lowly folk who may have been, who knows, tricked into believing some fancy message. Even the educated, even the authoritative, came to faith. Acts 6, verse 7 says, The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. We don't have time to look at it now, but this continued, continued through Peter's ministry, traveling from city to city and sharing in the synagogues about Yeshua, Jesus. And one thing I'd like to emphasize is that all the Jewish people becoming followers of Yeshua didn't pack it up and build a Baptist church and abandon their Jewish identity. They didn't do that. In fact, they were never meant to do that. They were never encouraged to. Just the opposite, in fact. We see in the book of James, later on, James 2, it says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly, and he gives him this instruction about not giving favoritism to rich people, but that word assembly that's there is the word synagogue. It doesn't say into your church building. It says into your synagogue. A synagogue is a distinctly Jewish place of worship. So it's, it's understood here that we're talking about a Jewish culture in our faith. Did you know, by the way, James's name wasn't James? It was Yaakov, Jacob. So he took for granted that these believers were worshiping and leading synagogue services. And it was through these synagogues that Jewish believers developed in and celebrated their faith in Messiah, Yeshua. And thankfully, thankfully, they didn't keep it to themselves. We see throughout the rest of the New Testament that the message of salvation traveled very, very quickly through the known world. And for the first time in history, non-Jewish people were getting to know the God of Israel, the God of the universe, through the Jewish people and the Jewish Messiah. So how wild is it then that today the gospel has spread throughout the entire world, and most ironically, it is the people of the nations who are now bringing the gospel back to Israel and sharing it with the Jewish people who now in this day and age, by and large, have not heard the truth. A number of years ago, my wife and I, uh, we went on a missions trip to Israel, which was life-changing for us, and solidified our call to Jewish ministry. And as we traveled around the country, we had lots of opportunity to just speak with people on the streets and in the bagel shops and everywhere that we went. You can eat well in Israel, by the way. Can I tell you, there was not one Israeli Jewish person, not one that I spoke to, who had ever even heard that Jesus claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. They did not, they did not know that. They thought he was the God of the Catholics, the Gentile something else. 
They did not know. They did not know. So when you think and wonder about Jewish people, you know, you might think, well, how, how can they not see? How can they, how, how would they not know that Jesus is the Messiah? How could they reject him? It seems so plain. Listen, it's only plain because the Lord has drawn the scales from your eyes. And the message has been shielded from the Jewish people for a very long time. For a very long time. So please, I ask you to join me in praying for the salvation of Israel. We know it's coming, but it doesn't come by accident. The Lord uses us, the body of Messiah, to bring the light to the nations, and he's using the nations to bring it back to his people. It's amazing. It's amazing. One day, Romans 11 tells us, all Israel will be saved. It's a promise. It's a beautiful promise for the body of Messiah, and it's directly linked to the return of our Messiah. So with that in mind, I want to charge you with this. Psalm 122, verse 6. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and may they prosper who love you. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem is, by extension, to pray for the Jewish people. Now, I don't know that David, when he was penning this psalm, had a clear vision that one day God would be worshipped by people of every nation like he is today. I'm, I'm not sure that he understood that. David probably didn't consider that relationship with God would have, been, would have to be modeled for the Jewish people by people outside of Israel. But, but here we are. It's an amazing thing. The Jewish Messiah of the Jewish scriptures has come, and most Jewish people today don't have a clue. That's why it's so, so important to pray for and to witness to Jewish people when and where you can. Now, you may not have Jewish people in your circle of influence. Maybe you do. A friend, a neighbor, a lawyer, a doctor. Come on. We're good at that stuff. It's okay, though, if you don't. It's okay that you don't, if you don't. You still have a crucial part to play in the whole plan of things. You can faithfully support messianic ministries such as my own that exist in part to bring the gospel to Jewish people. Your support, prayerful and financial, is absolutely crucial. And with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Chosen People Ministries. Everyone get a blue slip when you came in? If you don't have one, it's okay. I have more for you. You can meet me back at the book table in the back of the room after the service. I'd love to tell you more about the ministry. But in this pamphlet, there's uh, information about the beginnings of our ministry. As I mentioned, CPM is quite old. We're in our 128th year of ministry. So we were founded in 1894 by a Hungarian Orthodox Jewish rabbi named Leopold Kohn. Leopold Kohn came to America in search of the Messiah, specifically. And what he found, walking around the streets of Manhattan, was a Polish Presbyterian pastor with a heart for the Jewish people who told him that his inclination was right, the Messiah had come, his name is Yeshua, Jesus, and he was the Messiah of Israel that he had been waiting for his whole life. And it was perfectly okay, in fact, mandatory, that Jewish people believe in him. Rabbi Cohn couldn't keep that message to himself. Today, Chosen People Ministries is present in at least 16 countries around the world, serving the largest Jewish populations, including in Israel, throughout Europe, New York, and even where I live in southern Virginia. Did you know that in the past 20 years, the number of Jewish believers in Israel has more than tripled. There is a movement of God's spirit that is happening among Jewish people, not just in Israel, but throughout the world. I'm telling you, I'm seeing it firsthand. I had a gentleman just maybe six or eight weeks ago come into our congregation. He wasn't invited. He wasn't a, he wasn't a, a contact. He just walked through the doors. The Lord had drawn him there. He had a pretty miraculous story. He's in a probably in his mid-60s, I suppose, uh, a, a devout religious Jewish man. The Lord had been calling him, and he came with a million questions, and he said, I have a million questions. I said, that's great. We have all the time in the world. And he started coming to our services and, and worshiping and listening and, and 
really listening, really, really, really listening, and questioning, and questioning, and questioning. And one afternoon after our service, he came up to me and said, listen, Rabbi, he said, I still have a million questions. I said, great. He said, but I can tell you, I know in my heart this is true. I said, listen, man, from one Jewish person to another, you're going the right way. This is the truth. And he welled up. And he hasn't missed the service since. The Lord is doing something amazing among his people. And it is such a privilege to be a part of it. Certainly not because we're special in any way. That's true of all of us, right? It has nothing to do with our accolades. Everything about us is wonderful because of our wonderful Messiah. Because of that helper, the comforter that he has placed in us. The new life he has given us. The transformation he has provided for us. The shackles coming off of us. The fact that we get to walk away from our old life into newness of life. Further up and further in. I want to give you an opportunity to be a part of this momentous work. You see, um, the last part, sec- well, second to last and last part of this brochure has a little bit of it's a picture of my family that needs to be updated. There's information about our ministry. And then the very last part of this is where you guys can get involved. Now, in a moment, we're all going to take part in something very special together, an ancient Jewish tradition called the tearing of the slip. You see, on this slip, there's an opportunity for you to give me your information. And by doing so and giving it to uh, to me in one of the love offerings, or you can hand it to me at the book table, I can put you on my mailing list. You can receive my monthly prayer letter so you can know exactly what's happening in our ministry as we strive to reach the Jewish people in Hampton Roads and around the world Um, and how you can be a faithful supporter um, through prayer and finances, how you yourself can get involved in our ministry as well. It's a very exciting thing. Um, Your support, both prayerful and financial, goes a long way in making it possible for me to fulfill my calling to reach Jewish people with the gospel. You know, Acts 20.21 says, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus the Messiah. So let's do this. If you have a pamphlet, take that last thing. Don't rip it just yet. If you have, it's okay. I won't yell at you. Give it a little fold like an old pro. It's perforated. And on the count of three, we're going to rip it together. It makes my most favorite sound in the world. Ancient Jewish tradition. You ready? Let's take it. On the count of three, one, two, three. Oh, you are holy. Holy people. The Lord is doing something special here. If you would, truly, if you would fill out this information, it would mean a great deal to me for you to be on our team, just to receive our letter, if nothing else, to be praying for us. Um, Stick this pamphlet on your fridge. When you see my mug, you can pray for us. Um, it, it is a wonderful thing. Uh, if you're not quite as old school, um, there is a little QR code at the bottom of our bio. You can scan that with your phone and give your information that way digitally. It's all the same. Um, uh, Pastor already mentioned, if you do feel led to support our ministry financially and you'd like to write a check, please write it out to Chosen People Ministries, uh, not to Richland Baptist. If you already wrote it to Richland Baptist, we can take care of that. That's okay. Um, but if you could write it out to Chosen People Ministries, that would be wonderful. And uh, if, you wouldn't, if you would be so kind as to leave those, again, in the offering plate, or you can meet me back at the book table. I have a couple of books for sale that help support our ministry as well um, regarding the holy days and Jewish ministry and some really wonderful things. I have some free literature for you to take home with you as well. I'd love to meet and greet you. Uh, but before we end, I'd love to leave you with a blessing, if that's all right. This is the Aaronic Benediction from Numbers chapter 6. I'd like to sing it for you in Hebrew, and then we'll say it in English. It goes like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen. Thank you all very much.
Okay. Uh, how about we give the board a hand of applause for what he's doing? Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, it's exciting to hear what God is doing among the Jewish people. Uh, we're so grateful that we've been grafted in as Gentiles. Uh, we shouldn't take that for granted. So, Lord, uh, we thank you for Derek. We thank you for the Ministry of Chosen People Ministries. And we ask that you would continue to increase it, uh, expand its reach. We pray that you continue to provide all the resources necessary for you. So, Lord, we just want to offer to you these tithes and offerings, love offerings. We, we give them to you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We bless you, Lord, as our Messiah, our Savior. Uh, in fellowship with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Lord, we do pray for the Jewish people that you would bring them to salvation. We thank you, Lord, that um, we thank you for the witness that has been shared today that there, there is something very special happening among Jewish people. Uh, and we see that as, again, an indicator that the final harvest is being, being prepared and there is a great awakening that is coming. Lord, we're excited about that. We continue to pray for it. We ask that you would usher it in soon, usher it in quickly. And Lord, we just pray for anyone uh, who personally is um, experiencing some special need or concern today, that uh, there's a need for physical healing, there's a need for something happening emotionally. Lord, there, maybe there's an emotional wound that's being dealt with. Maybe there's a need for uh, coming out from under the oppression of the enemy. Whatever it may be, Lord, we just want to bring that to you, and we, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, would, would um, encourage those who have a special need or concern, uh, just seeking after wisdom, coming forward for salvation, to accept Christ as Lord. Whatever it may be, we just ask that you would prompt us, Lord, to hear you clearly during this time and to, to come forward and to receive prayer as needed. Lord, we bless your holy name. We ask that you would uh, bless Derek as he leaves us today and drives all the way back home. We ask that you keep him safe. I know he ran into the thunderstorms uh, coming this morning. was a bit delayed. And uh, we just pray that you would give him safe passage back home, uh, back to his congregation and to his family. So, Lord, we love you. We give you honor and glory in all things. Amen. So go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>